talking about solving hard problems might sound a little dry, uh, you know, it's kind of an eat your vegetables thing. But our host of this session today, our next guest, um, you would never describe as dry, I think. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing her for a lot of years now. Uh, Malia Lazu has been a force for change in the city for 20 years. She started by founding Mass Vote as a way to increase civic engagement and get more people involved in the political process. Uh, her career has taken her uh, to a lot of heights since then. She's been at MIT, at one of our founders. And now she is the Chief Experience and Culture Officer, officer of Berkshire Bank. Uh, and when I heard that announcement, I couldn't think of a better pairing. Berkshire Bank is really uh, establishing itself as a force for good in the city, and they couldn't have a better partner than Malia Lazu. Malia. And just to clarify, I started when I was five. Um, in case anyone's doing math. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. We're coming inside to get warm and talk about how to solve hard problems. And I'm going to be your moderator for the day. I do have some time to make some remarks. Um, and I wanted to start by talking about how do you solve hard problems? And often, we think it takes hard work. And I would say that that's not what actually solves hard problems. And so I want to offer up a couple of themes to hold in your heart while we're thinking about how do we solve hard problems. Because a lot of times when you work hard, you become overwhelmed, you become overworked, and you become exhausted. And you cannot co-create from that place. You cannot think of solutions when you're overworked. So I want to throw a couple of themes out. The first is, if you want to solve a hard problem, take time to reflect. Why? Why are you taking this on? Is it because it's something you just want to do for this week? Or is it because it's something that actually feeds you, that nourishes you? The second thing you have to do if you want to hard solve hard problems is love yourself. And that's probably one of the hardest things to do. As a community organizer, I love my community. And it's really hard for me to find time for me to love myself. But what we need right now is time to love ourselves. And when you're going out in the world to solve a hard problem, people are going to laugh at you. People are going to tell you, don't do it. People are going to tell you, it's never going to change. People are going to tell you all the reasons why this hard problem isn't a problem at all. And if you don't have space to know that what you're doing is worth it and that you're worth it, and if you don't tell yourself that, you're not going to be able to help solve hard problems. And the final one is check your ego. We all want to solve hard problems, and we all want to be the person that solves hard problems. But what actually solves hard problems are groups of people, tribes, tribes that decide to live differently. And that means as a leader, you have to be ready to lead from behind. And that takes ego. And it's great to be up here on stage. It's great to be like, look, everyone wants to listen to me. But you need to make sure that there's places where you can have your ego in check. So I want to just throw those things out generally about how to solve, solve hard problems. Before I get to talking about the hard problem I'm trying to solve right now. As Brendan said, I'm the Chief Culture and Experience Officer of Berkshire Bank. And I come to the banking world via community organizing. Um, as Brendan said, I started Mass Vote because I wanted to get people to vote to change the country. Um, and after doing that, what I realized is that while voting, while issue-based politics is great, it doesn't necessarily get to the core problems that, that we're facing as a country, which is how to come together. And so I started doing some much more basic community organizing um, with Harry Belafonte. And I don't know how many people here know Harry Belafonte. Yeah. Um, all right, for the, for the younger folks in the room, um, because we all know, um, you might know the song, Deo, 
Damn. He wrote that, and he was the first man to sell a million records, like the first person ever <clears throat> to sell a million records. He was also the first black man to be touched affectionately by a white woman on television. It was Petulia Clark during the Norman Lear Maxwell House special. Some of us might remember that. Um, and he also brought Martin Luther King his house, and he brought Martin Luther King his life insurance because he knew Martin Luther King was going to die and he wanted or be killed, and he wanted to make sure that Martin Luther King's life and family was going to be okay. And so I had the pleasure of working with this man who was living history, who had made it in showbiz, you know what I mean? Like all, all that, you know, he had all of that stuff, hanging out with Sidney Portier and all that. As a matter of fact, he um, won more awards than Sidney Portier, but he got blacklisted because um, of the social stuff that he was doing and Sidney Portier wasn't, or else you guys may be more familiar. Anyway. Um, he decided that he was going to take on criminal justice. And he had seen a five-year-old girl get arrested, um, get handcuffed. The handcuffs fell off because they were too big, so they, hog they, they got the plastic handcuffs, so they really made sure that they handcuffed this five-year-old girl. And when he saw that, after all the work, all the success he had, he realized something had to change and that the criminal justice system had to be reformed. And that's what we started working on together. And while trying to figure out how do we reform the criminal justice system, you also have to figure out what do we do with the brutality of American poverty? We're really okay in America with poverty being brutal. That's okay, we're fine with it, especially if we're not living in it. And what we saw was that gangs are an outcome of that acceptance. Gangs are a necessary organization in violent neighborhoods. They protect people, they help people make money, they help people eat, they help people do all of those things, and yet they are one of uh, the leading cause of criminality amongst young people. And so what we wanted to do is figure out how do we keep gangs intact but have them become legitimate because gangs are only given black market products to sell, drugs, women, guns. So when you have those products to sell and that's what you're being given to sell, that's what you're gonna sell and it's going to beget more violence. And so we started working with gangs to help them open legitimate businesses, not deconstruct the gang because that's actually what they need and America's not changing poverty anytime soon so we need to protect these children. But helping the gang become more like a social club you know, um, like what, what Jack Kennedy's dad was a part of, you know, where, whenever he was bootlegging. You know, j just become something a little more respectable. Um, and it was amazing. It was amazing. We actually helped um, a, a gang in Columbus, Ohio, open a coffee shop and they started growing organic foods. Um, and it was just beautiful to see and to see how the community started supporting them. Homeboy Industries is an example of this type of creative entrepreneurship. And if you're not familiar with, um, with Homeboy Industries, please, please look them up. So this is what got sort of like the, the building economy bug going um, in, in me. And then I burnt out, as one does, um, when working in the streets in 26 states. Um, and I came back to Boston to settle down a little bit, to, to find my way again. And that's when I went to MIT. And I started working to support the creative economy in Boston. Because we're so dope at so many things, but culture, creative economy, things that are kind of cool, kind of fun, kind of pleasureful, we get a little nervous around. We don't do pleasure well, it makes us nervous. I do pleasure fine, but what I notice um, is that we, we get uncomfortable about that. And so I started an accelerator program called Accelerate Boston. And we've, um, over seven years, we brought over 100 um, minority businesses through the process. We got over 20 to market. You may know some of the businesses, Fresh Food Generation, Beauty Link, Trill Fit. Um, one of our entrepreneurs actually just got a dispensary license. Um, and so I like to joke around and say our potheads are going to be the richest out of anyone in the in, in our accelerator program. Um, but it was really awesome to see just how much we could have a creative economy here in Boston. And it was in doing that work that I came across Berkshire Bank. And as I was consulting primarily for banking and, and finance, Berkshire Bank was coming into the community 
um, and they wanted to come in in a different way. Um, they were from the Berkshires. Um, that's not necessarily known to be a diverse area. Um, but the bank was from Vermont to Philly. And so they wanted to figure out how does Berkshire Bank operate in Philadelphia, operate in different communities. And what was so great about that position is I was able to bring what I learned to, um, to this work. And what I learned from all of the entrepreneurship work that I had been doing is first that the wealth gap is a known outcome. We like to wring our hands about the wealth gap. You know, we hear the stats here in Boston that the average black family has $8 of wealth and the average white family has $250,000 of wealth. And we hear that stat and we think, no, that can't be possible. Well, of course it can be possible because certain people can get mortgages in certain places and certain people can't. It's not that white people are sitting on $250,000 in cash. It's that they have ways of developing wealth that, for example, when my father wanted to buy a house, he couldn't buy a house, and maybe where your father or your parents could buy a house. So what we see is that the outcomes of institutional, structural, and implicit bias give us the, the wealth gap that we have now. The other thing that I learned is that there are gaps in society that make it impossible for our well-intentioned ideas to have impact. No one likes hearing that wealth gap number. As a matter of fact, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's just not true. Because it's much easier to just be like, oh, let me just look away than, than actually sit in that stat. But if we sit in that stat, that the average black family has $8 of wealth, and we figure out, well, let's just give them a mortgage then, right? Then they can buy a house. Let's give them a mortgage in Brookline, then they can buy a house. That's not actually fixing the problem. And the gaps that we need to address in order to ensure that we're actually being responsible and honest about taking on this problem are first, the history of slavery and indentured servitude in, in this country. We need to take on the segregation of how we live. You may want to meet new people, but it's really hard in, in neighborhoods, especially here in Boston. And finally, how do we take on a culture that has this talk feel like it should sit in charity? Right, everything I'm saying, oh, well, I'm sure foundations are working on that. And so what I wanted to do in Berkshire Bank is say, no, we're gonna make this a business model. Because if there's one thing I know about capitalists is that they like to make money. And if they're making money, then we're probably gonna roll along. And if we hit another financial crisis, we might not get cut as much as if it's sitting in charity, right? Charity is always the first thing to go. So what I wanted to figure out is how do we make this? How do we take on the wealth gap? That was the hard problem I wanted to solve. How do we take on the wealth gap as a publicly traded $14 billion company? Well, this is how we're doing it. The first thing that we had to figure out is what are we doing wrong? And there was a lot of things that we were doing wrong. The first was that we weren't actually reaching out in a way that incentivized our employees to network with other people. If you're a loan officer, you need to make a certain amount of money. You can do that with a book you have. If I tell you to go and meet new people and I want you to start you know, giving mortgages to other people, that, those are your bonuses that you're putting at risk, right? So now how do we incentivize the way people should be incentivized? The second thing that we wanted to look at is what are our products? And while that may sound like the fix-all, and it might be like, oh, hey, right, you know, I mean, like, you know, people have bad credit scores and, and you know, we, we need to make sure that we lower the bar so that we can be more diverse. Sure, I'll give that to you because of the wealth gap is what it is. But I will also say that there are many wealthy people of color that we could have been banking and that we'll start to bank. So it's not just about the products. It's actually about who the people are and how they're incentivized working for you. The last piece of this is we got into the community. So rather than, I mean, we have a beautiful office, 38th floor, 60 State Street. Everyone's more than welcome to come and get through the security and ride the long elevator. And it's the most sterile, like least 
pleasure. Like, I'm like, oh, this is why people are miserable, because we come into buildings like this every day. Um, and you're not going to figure out how to work with the community from the 38th floor of State Street. You're not going to make friends with the community from the 38th floor of State Street. So what we're doing now is, rather than opening branches, we're opening community centers. So if you see what Capital One did um, with the coffee shops, that's great, that's awesome. We're just getting rid of the bank. And we're opening the first one in November in Dudley. Oh, December. I keep on saying November because I want it to be open. Uh, and I just saw Gary's like, no, December. And it's going to be free co-working space um, for inner city accelerator members. And we're going to have free event space for nonprofits. And it's all free. It's everything. And it'll allow us to be in the community to give back. Banks are extractive by nature. And so what we're figuring out as we try to figure out how do you solve this hard problem is how do we get authentic enough so that we can actually come up with a solution. And that's what we're doing this year. I'll close by one of my favorite quotes by Martin Luther King. Either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop this kind of dangerous unselfishness. We are now at a time in our country where unselfishness is what is going to get us to continue to evolve. Because we're marching on, the world continues to turn. But unselfishness is what we all need to ensure America actually goes into the 21st century in a way that her and her children can thrive. So thank you so much for coming to join us to figure out how we're going to solve hard problems. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, David, um, who is the CEO of Gratify, and he serves as the entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School. And he's been an innovator in the Boston scene, tech, everything else for a decade. David. Thank you so much for opening us up with that level of energy. So I'm going to attempt to continue on, but uh, thanks for having me. Would love to share a little bit today about a hard problem that we're solving around education. So if you look at the biggest problems that we face today, they are generally ones that affect millions of people. And so there's really two industries where that you could see absolute challenges, and one is education, and one is healthcare. And both of these have really common elements, right? These are public goods, these are important problems to solve, these are both industries where the cost to provide the actual service has risen over time, and on top of that, they've passed that cost over to consumers. Just look at the cost of college over the last 20 years. It's gone from 65,000 to a four-year degree to 170,000. That is absolutely insane in a short period of time. And we're lucky to live in a place where there's a lot of educated people. If I look around the room today, I sense that many of you have had that benefit. In fact, maybe it'll take a moment here. If you have gone to college or you have a degree, just stand up. Okay, and just remain standing for a second. Okay, so we're in a place where people recognize that education is so important to what we do. So stay standing for just a second. Now, have a seat if you have no debt from college. Okay, so you remain standing if you, if you borrowed something, right? So this gives you a little bit of sense of like what's out there. And so if you owe less than $50,000 remaining on your balances, have a seat, okay? Less than 100,000? Okay, so we have six-figure bills right here, and so let's give them a hand for investing in their education. <laughs> now, it turns out you're in really good company. Today, seven out of 10 people graduate with debt, and it is a massive, massive challenge in this industry. The Brady's, I don't know if any of you watches HGTV, but I've been glued to the television when they renovated the house. And if you were to put those six kids through school today, that's over a million dollars, right? An insane amount of money. 
Looking at the student debt problem over the course of just the next couple years, this is a staggering number, like 1.6 trillion. It's actually the biggest growing consumer debt form that there is faster than anything else, and it impacts a broad range of people. People typically think that it affects just millennials. That is not true. In fact, there's just as many people who owe student debt above 40 than people who are under 30. And it's disproportionate, right? Two, women own two-thirds of the debt. Minorities, nine out of 10 have to borrow to go to college. And so it's a massive problem across the board. And the biggest challenge is that it delays everything else in life. When you have student debt, you can't save up. It takes longer to get married. It takes longer to buy a house. You don't contribute to your retirement for many, many years. So it's a big, big problem. So how do we solve this problem? Now, you can hope, right? You can wait for it to be forgiven. So there's a little bit of, uh, in the last 10 years, less than 0.01% has been forgiven. So you can't just wait for that. I don't know if you guys caught this in the news, a billionaire, right? $34 million, what an awesome, awesome thing to do. So on, on stage, you get an education, you get an education, you get an education. It was amazing, right? But that only affected a small number of people. So $34 million it was just the graduating class at Morehouse. And then if you look at the future, it has absolutely hit the debate stage, right? Can we provide education free for everyone? Pretty impactful thing to solve. Now, waiting is not the best thing to do. So let me just play a short clip for you. Why did she borrow $42,000 for tuition? Why did she borrow $19,400 for room and board? Those frames with a single letter. Why did she borrow $1,300 for a laptop? And $3,100 for books? $2,200 for health care. That's how you use the block. Thank you. $1,100 for student fees. And $250 for a graduation gown. Sophie, come on, let's go. She did it to work for you. And now you can do something for her with a job benefit that helps your employees pay off their student loans. So our belief is that the single biggest beneficiary of an educated workforce are companies, employers, and what we're doing is setting up a benefit that enables them, just like healthcare, just like a 401k, to be able to get that benefit themselves and help pay down the loans. It is a win-win for both employees and employers. From the employee standpoint, it's really easy. When you start at a company, you get this benefit say $100 a month paid off every single month to your student loan. So in addition to the, all the other benefits that you get. And from the company standpoint, just given how tough it is to recruit in today's economy, they will very happily provide this as a benefit. We're lucky to work with 800 plus companies that are leading the way in doing this. Multiple industries, they have absolutely found that this is a benefit that consumers want and this is, we're just beginning to chip away at this problem. And when you think about just overall the problems that we're solving, the ability for us to provide education, healthcare, all of those benefits to the people that are in the workforce, that is the problem that we're trying to solve. So I wanna just transition a little bit in terms of the theme of today, solving the hard problems and how do you actually do so. My, my background, in addition to being an entrepreneur, I have worked with thousands of other entrepreneurs to help them solve their problems. I have eight tips, many of these mistakes I've made before and many ones I've seen other people make and so if I can share some of those with you, hopefully you won't make those same mistakes. The first one that I hear a ton of is when you think of a hard problem to solve and you come up with this solution, many founders the first time around think that the idea is worth everything, right? Oh, I've got this brilliant insight in terms of how to fix something. Turns out the idea is worthless, right? Anyone can have the idea. It's like what you do with the idea, so don't make that mistake. As part of that, when you find a hard problem to solve, absolutely involve other people. So as soon as you can find someone to partner with, 
don't go out alone, right? Find a, uh, someone else in the community, even if it's someone that's got a slightly different idea. Maybe it's a competitor. Like, you want to share those ideas. The third one is around once you have that hard problem that you want to solve and you have some vision for where you want to take it, make sure that you share that vision. And, and the analogy I like to paint is you've got to be able to show someone what the summit is, like what your ultimate goal is, and at the same time provide like a pretty good base camp, a realistic way to get started. Because without those two, as soon as you meet someone, if you do an elevator pitch and you only share your summit and they think this is what you think is realistic, they think you're pie in the sky, that'll never happen. And the reverse is even worse, right? If you're talking about a big problem to solve and you're really excited about this, one milestone that's pretty realistic that you just achieved, but they never get to hear your vision, they think the idea is too small. So you wanna make sure to anchor someone on both of those right away. This lesson is one they learned from TripAdvisor. So if anyone's used TripAdvisor, you know what the service is. The CEO of TripAdvisor had on his wall every single day a little post-it that said speed wins. And I actually interpreted it a little bit differently. It's not speed just running aimlessly in a single direction, but it's the number of cycles, right? So how often can you experiment? And so the more that you do that, the quicker that you can advance. And that math up there, if uh, for you math types, it's if you make a 10% improvement in something, but you do it once a month, you'll end up 3x from where you are. But if you make a 1% change every single day, 37x, right? So big, big difference. When you're experimenting, absolutely get used to failure. This was the hardest thing that I had to deal with as a founder and entrepreneur. Like, you face so much failure. Some of it's pretty academic. Cool, I tried this marketing campaign, didn't work. And some of it's pretty personal. Like, maybe you failed. Maybe you failed someone on your team. They're really hard things to learn, but make sure you get comfortable with it because you're gonna do it again and again. When you have that failure, the big thing is you've gotta keep in mind what your North Star is, right? You keep making progress towards that. You're gonna pivot along the way, you're gonna focus on different things, you'll switch paths, but you're ultimately marching towards this direction. You wanna make sure to keep on going in that. This is a little bit less than from venture capital, which is progress is not linear. And so when you're building and solving a hard problem, one big thing is making sure that each time you make progress, it is not this like steady process, right? You're gonna have different phases in the beginning. You may have a team. When you build the team, then you have something else, right? You're building a market. Like every single time something big happens, you gotta make sure that you're, you're celebrating the successes kind of along the way. And my final thought here is solving hard problems. You wanna make sure it involve other people. Every single hard problem started with one person with an idea, got other people, they built upon it, they failed a little bit, they figured out something that worked, they kept on going. The, every single one of these ideas has a near-death experience, but it starts with one person, so let it be you. All right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, that was awesome. And I'm glad I got, I, to the two people who are standing for the 100,000, we love you, we send you. Oh, I, was got, I was glad I got to sit down, I wasn't the last person. Um, you know, we can all just decide to, you know, not pay ever. What would happen then if we just all decide we, we weren't gonna pay our loans? That's a harder problem to solve. <laughs> well, maybe that's our next meeting. Um, so <clears throat> why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the problem I'm solving, and then let them know what hard problem you're working on. Speak amongst yourselves. I know people don't do this, but this is what other cultures do. That's right, talk amongst yourselves. Look, you're liking it, you're laughing, you're seeing each other's humanity. Oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap once. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap twice. If you can hear the sound of my voice, clap three times. See, that's how much we want to talk to each other. Look at that. Oh my God, I love it. I love it. Exchange cards, go to lunch. My next woman that I get to introduce is when I talk about the creative economy here in Boston, when I talk about Boston's cool factor, when I talk about a historic black power, this woman sort of embodies all of that. Um, wait a second, she gave me, she gave me a specific thing.
thing to say. I think because she knew that I was just going to be like, I love Kai Janie so much. Um, so Kai Janie is the principal of Afro Kai and the owner and chief curator of Black Market. Kai Janie. Malia, you do realize I got married 28 years ago? I'm now Kai Grant. Janie is my maiden name. That's OK. That's quite all right. Janie is. <laughs> so good morning to everybody. Let's see. So my name is Kai Grant, and I'm the principal of AfriKai LLC and the owner and chief curator of Black Market Dudley. My ultimate desire for this talk this morning is to help you understand three things. What success looks like from a black entrepreneur's lens. What success looks like from a black female entrepreneur's lens. And what success looks like from a black female locally grown entrepreneur's lens. It dawned on me last night that I'm the visual representation of what success looks like in Boston because I stand on the shoulders of an amazing community whose narrative has been erased from the economic conversation. And yet, I've been able, with my powerful black girl magic, to help reignite a creative economy in a commercial district that has been disinvested and underserved for a half of century. So I, in the spirit of my four parents, have sparked and revived an underground railroad ecosystem of emerging founders and artisans and activists whose brand identities and voices need magnification. So what does success look like from our lens? First and foremost, I want to introduce you a little more intimately to myself and provide context um, from who I am. I want you guys to understand that I've been on an entrepreneurial journey since I was a young girl. And so after that, I'll transition into the 10 insights on black entrepreneurship in Boston. Is it going? Yeah, here we go. So what does success look like in Boston from our lens? I'm a, ser a serial entrepreneur. I'm literally someone who has ADD, which is why I have notes up here. And I need to keep focused. I'm four generations Roxbury. I'm a former retail manager coming out of beauty and fashion. I worked in Copley Place for about 20 years. I'm a socioeconomic game changer. I am someone who deeply believes that I need to provide platforms as a dream doula for many other micro businesses and uh, launching entrepreneurs. I also have a background as a social media ninja, someone who is very proficient uh, in really defining a voice. And if you were to ask people in City Hall, I think they would call me your friendly neighborhood disruptor. <laughs> I come from a long heritage in Roxbury. I have over 100 years. We are deeply rooted. And as Malia mentioned, my maiden name is Janie. And so we come from a family of entrepreneurs, artisans. We come from military. We come from political leadership, spiritual uh, leaders, and also activists. Roxbury love is a term that I love. And this mural can be found on Warren Street in Roxbury. But it definitely has kind of defined this presentation because there are a lot of reasons for us to have this love for our community. My journey began as a MECO student. Um, I was also in the Boston Public Schools for a minute. My parents are educators, and they believed in us getting a right education. And so as a kid in the 80s, 
I was bused out into a suburb. Anybody know Reading, Massachusetts? Anybody from Reading? Anybody, any Reading Rockets here? Nobody's a Reading Rocket? Well, I was bused out into the suburb of Reading. I was actually the only, only black girl in my fifth and sixth grade class. Um, and from a young age, I realized that suburban kids did not have access to bodegas or corner stores. <laughs> and so I saw an opportunity, and I quickly filled that need by going to the store and getting packs of bubble yum, which costed 25 cents. And I would sell each piece individually for 25 cents to my classmates. <laughs> if I decided to buy it, I would obviously have a nice profit. However, sometimes I had sticky fingers, and so I made pure profit at times as well. <laughs> Fast forward to high school, 1984, I was a freshman. Um, as a class, let's see, as a, a class, it was, it was very trendy to, in the 80s, you didn't really have this onus of being PC. So it was extremely, common to have racism be a part of our journeys. And so the class decided as a joke, they were going to, I decided to run for president, but they decided to elect me as a class joke. And basically, when Obama got elected in 2008, it was like redemption song for me, because I felt like, oh, okay, so you all want to see what a real black president is, and so that ascension into the White House made it sweeter for me. But as retribution, I decided that I was going to take their narrative of this girl from Roxbury. They assumed that I had access to drugs and all of these things, when they were doing kegs and things that I had no idea, no idea what was happening in the woods inside of Reading. But they decided that that was the, the story that they put on me. And so I took my power back and decided to take uh, oregano and roll it up as though it was marijuana. So I started cannabis distribution back in ninth grade, and I sold it to them for double what it would have been worth in the market. <laughs> so fast forward to 1993, uh, there was this boom in mar direct marketing, and, and I somehow got introduced to uh, becoming a consultant for Mary Kay Cosmetics. And I realized that there was overt uh, erasure in the story of having makeup for melanated people. And it, it really was clear that I wanted to change that narrative and really launch my own line of cosmetics and become Mary Kay, which is what I did. Because in 2001, as I was becoming a makeup artist in the industry, I identified a gap in the market, and I launched uh, an inclusive brand called Lip Hop Cosmetics that ended up going viral thanks to uh, a mention from Wendy Williams in New York. Um, I'm, one, I'm actually one person separated from Wendy. But those who have Roxbury roots understand that she also has those same roots because she graduated from, uh, she was at WRBB on the campus of Northeastern. So she was also someone uh, that had close ties to our neighborhood. And the concept of lip hop went viral from there. The associate beauty editor, for teen people contacted me, and our product was placed inside of that magazine uh, with the cover of Little Bow Wow and Hilary Duff. So from that point, um, the economic downturn became a big issue, and the store that I was managing in Copley Place called CO Bigelow, which was um, owned by the limited brands had closed, even though we were making a great profit. And I was uh, challenged by my husband to go into the community and do some good. And so I established uh, Diamond Girls Boston, which helped teen girls ages 11 through 17 with esteem and entrepreneurial thinking and action. Um, I had them develop a product called Diamond Dust, and we added a social media campaign to that 
uh, called, uh, it was, it was a, a charge to get to Black Girls Rock, which is a show and a movement started by Beverly Bond. And there was another person with Roxbury Roots that I reached out to and that I'm se one person separated from, Stephen Hill, who was the program director for BET. And at one point, he was here in Roxbury at WILD. He's a graduate of Brown University. And so we told him of our story. The girls were selling the product. We sold $1,500 worth in one day. Um, and we won a campaign for about 1500 And all we needed were tickets to get to Black Girls Rock. And so we were able to do that um, and get to Black Girls Rock in 2013, where the girls were able to meet the president of BET, Deborah Lee, and also the founder of Black Girls Rock, Beverly Bond, in addition to Kelly Rowland and Regina King and a wealth of other uh, celebrities. And so fast forward to 2011, I joined the board, I'm still laid off at this point, and I joined the board of Dudley Main Streets, um, and I chaired the Economic Restructuring Committee, which gave me a lot of insight into Dudley Square. I was appointed by former Mayor Menino uh, to the Dudley Vision Advisory Task Force, where along with uh, my colleague Br Bridget Wallace, we advocated heavily for innovation space inside of this $124 million development. Uh, we met with the mayor, we met with Cairo Shin, who was the city planner at the time, Tim Rowe from Cayman Inc Inc Incubation Center, Neil Gershenfeld at the Fab Labs at MIT, president of Wentworth, and a host of other um, community players. And so our goal was to rebrand Dudley as the innovation education district of the city. We also launched a test kitchen out of our backyard at the same time, which there were people that literally wanted to occupy our backyard. Who remembers the Occupy movement? 2011? Yeah. And so um, we were doing it to get the demographical information and to test uh, and see if there was uh, a place for this idea of a superstar protein called jerk chicken. And so Fort Hill Jerk Chicken was launched. We partnered with Jen Fagel out of Commonwealth Kitchen. Her and her team helped us uh, to understand what it means to have a culinary business that's permitted inside of a shared kitchen space. And word of mouth, uh, we went viral in 2015 and got Best of Boston for Best bar Barbecue, Best Backyard Barbecue. So I launched a concept that I'm working on right now uh, in 2017 called Black Market. We are still in the works with our culinary business and have a liquor license and waiting for some more zoning relief. Uh, this concept, Black Market, um, was really envisioned to help close this quarter of a million dollar wealth gap that Malia mentioned. We, found, we founded it in 2017 after a transformative trip to the continent of Africa. We first visited Egypt and came home very eager uh, to understand uh, culture and uh, what uh, a transformative society would look like right inside of our community. And then 90 days later, we were in Senegal where we actually got the name and the idea of doing something cooperative um, and com community-based in nature. So back to successful entrepreneurship from a black lens. The first thing you should know is we understand entrepreneurship from a very different perspective. Um, as a black entrepreneur and as a female entrepreneur, as somebody who's really entrenched inside of uh, local um, community in Boston, the desire for a better future for our families and our community is a number one. This picture that you see is my Nana Janie and my Pa Janie. 
Nana Janie and Pa were celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. They have been married for 54 years before one of them passed. They raised seven kids right in the projects of Orchard Park. That's where New Edition comes from, if folks don't know Orchard Park. Uh, and also Cheney Street in Grove Hall. All of them have bachelor's degrees, and at least have four of them have masters. And my dad, my dad who is pictured on the right-hand side, he's the youngest, uh, he has a doctorate's degree. What she did for me as an entrepreneur was help me to have such a very strong sense of self, self-worth, and also self-sufficiency. And I think that is part of our story and really leads the conversations and helps us and informs us on how we do business. Number two, the courage to lead. My dad, uh, this is him as a student at Northeastern, he had the courage to lead. He's my leadership sensei. He's the one I channel and he's still with us, he's in DC. He's run several school systems. Uh, he's run DC school system, Rochester, and also Newark. And he had the courage to stand up, even in his youth. Um, and as an undergrad, May 1968, he and 12 others, or he and 11 others, took over the president's office with 13 demandments that included black presence on the campus in Northeastern, a black studies program. 50 scholarships to black students, a reevaluation of the curriculum, and contributions to the history department. So out of that, they founded the African American Institute, which is still around today. It's called the John D. O'Brien Institute. Gritty pioneer spirit, number, number three. Your entrepreneurship, when you're in a black community, and from our perspective, always has a special kind of grit. My husband, featured here with my four sons, uh, is an immigrant from London via Jamaica. His family established 13 businesses here. They, his dad was the president of Caribbean, Caribbean Cultural Center, and he was the founding president of Windsor Cricket, or he was one of the presidents of Windsor Cricket Club as well. That organization really incubated the Blue Halav Corridor in also Codman Square. Um, such businesses that are still around today are Lenny's Bakery, Ollie's Roti. The West Indian Parade comes uh, with strong roots um, in that organization, in addition to a host of other businesses. What my husband has taught me and his family um, is that nothing is impossible. You can't take no for an answer. You can't think that something, a problem can't be solved. And so that family, there's 15, I think, all together in his father's generation. All of them own their own businesses. I don't even think one worked for anybody else. This fourth point is really about vision beyond what things look like. Um, and also remembering what your community looked like when it was thriving and when there was investment. Uh, there are two pictures here. One is a before picture of our business, Black Market in Dudley Square. Um, and that is uh, what it looked like, I think, for years prior to us taking that space over and activating it. Uh, we must see beyond blight. We must be able to push through the narrative that our communities are the armpits of Boston, which I've seen on our social media page plenty of times. There's over half a billion dollars worth of development going on within a one mile radius of Dudley Square. So we have to understand the future and we must invest in it. Number five, we are entrepreneurs that have to take real calculated risks. My husband and I went into Dudley with our eyes wide open, understanding what the challenges are and not depending on this idea of if you build it, they will come. We used our own networks and believed that we had a community that would support us uh, and help to make Dudley a destination again. We also had the skill sets in the background, my retail management and understanding how to hire, how to merchandise, um, how to operate a business, uh, really 
assisted us in addition to my husband growing up in different family businesses and understanding from a grassroots standpoint. It took us 90 days to launch and we were very adamant about this being a for us, by us, we are our own saviors concept. This is us when we first launched. This is a snapshot of, this is pre-business. I look back, it makes me smile um, to see this because it's been quite the fight in order for us to continue. Thank you. So being able to shift your paradigm, having a flexible standpoint, understanding struggles uh, and changes in local economies, very important to our entrepreneurship. Um, being able to shift your revenue and business models, it was important for us to have a space that was flexible, something that we could be able to work within no matter what it looks like. Amazon is a monster. We had to make sure that we were able to create an atmosphere and an environment inside of brick and mortar uh, that would be something that people would be drawn to. Creating a mission-driven framework. Um, since Africans have touched down in this country, uh, even prior to being enslaved and bought here, we've always had this concept of Ubuntu, which is I am because you are. So we started doing the work as a nascent pop-up market and understood that we needed to move more into economic justice, also providing a space for arts and culture, and lending a platform for civic engagement. And so launching a movement is what we did, and our programming is is movement driven. We have marketplaces, film screenings, fundraisers, community meetings. Um, you can see we had a Black Panther event here, and this was an amazing time where we were able to create a Wakanda-like environment inside of our space. We have baby boomers that are vending with us in addition to junior high school students. And so we range from baby boomers to Gen Z. Our success is something that we know is harnessed from the energy of our ancestors. So I typically look at Harriet Tubman, who put in about 60,000 miles on foot, 19 trips from Canada to Maryland. I look at Sojourner Truth and the fact that she made the feminist movement go viral with her speech, Ain't I a Woman? Um, I look at Malcolm X and his drive and determination for self-sufficiency and for economic development, and mostly uh, Marcus Garvey, who was doing fund raising and, and all kinds of amazing feats, uh, millions of dollars in stock options and created a whole fleet of ships, uh, about three of them, to have this uh, relationship with the continent. Lastly, I would say the endurance of a marathoner is what it takes in order for us uh, to showcase success as a black entrepreneur inside of our communities. Uh, the state of retail is very difficult. Foot traffic is little to none. We have an opiate crisis that we're grappling with, uh, political unrest, and potentially an economic downturn that's looming. So I'd like to wrap with the fact that our economic health depends on real investment in equity right now. And that has to start with the indigenous populations of our community. Um, we fight for that every day. Roxbury is the hub and the black center of the city of Boston, and we thwart gentrification and displacement. Uh, that's, it's rapidly outpacing our retention, but in order to do that, we have to continue to do the following. We need to activate blighted spaces while we're waiting for development. We have to be intentional around community benefits for, de for developers that come in. Financial literacy is key. We need to offer commercial condos so that people can buy and stay inside of the community, subsidize uh, business spaces instead of subsidized rentals. Uh, first time home buying opportunities. There would be no black market in any of our other businesses if we did not own our home. And we need to make sure there are wealth creation opportunities because 
we won't be able to sustain and stay inside of our communities without it. It takes a village for us to make this successful story, and we couldn't have done it without dozens of community partners and our tribe at the foundation. So thank you. All right, we, I'm looking at the time and we have three minutes. So I'd like to open it up for one. We have time. We have 10 minutes? We have 10 <laughs> minutes. Um, so I would like to open it up for more than one question then. Um, is there anything in the audience ready to go? Any question, any comment, any response? Well, while these any experience for any yourself. Any experience, um, yes, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Good, um, my question is for Kaidi Grant. Uh, my name is Janine Williams, and I'm also from Roxbury. Um, my question is: Do you see a wave stirring in regards to Black entrepreneurship here in Boston, Roxbury, and? I personally know that Black Market and you yourself has been a part of that, but if you can elaborate or give your opinion in regards to seeing what is spurring. Yeah, I think there is a wave that's coming, and we need to be prepared enough in order to surf that wave. And so accelerator programs like Malia's program um, that she launched in Smarter in the City and uh, Roxbury Innovation Center and Fairmont Innovation Lab, uh, we're looking at ways that we can provide access for those dreamers, those thinkers, those founders uh, that really don't have the tools. Uh, they're resourceful, and that's what we have to be, regardless of whether we have something or not, but they may not have the resources that are readily available. Um, so being able to be prepared for that wave is what we're doing now, um, in addition to um, just manifesting. We, we have to continue uh, to dream big, and we have to continue to be able to bring forth these types of micro-business ideas so that we can scale up. If I could just add to that as well, I think one of the things that we're seeing in Roxbury is that there may be an opportunity to tap into the larger economy that Kai was talking about that's growing around Roxbury. And I think that's something really exciting as well. To see black market be a block away from, what is it, 2,000 um, mi mixed um, market rate housing is being built, right. hotels are being built, half a block away from black market. Um, and it's when, when I talk about segregation, that's part of the outcomes of that. Like, if you're not told to go to Roxbury, and I know, because I live in Roxbury, I mean, the three of us can tell you, when you say, I'm living in Roxbury, people have a certain assumption. My mother's white. When she gets on the, when she gets into the taxi, and she asks the taxi to take him to my house, he looks at her, and he's like, are you sure? Because she's like a Chico's looking white lady. You know what I mean? Like, just like a typical white lady looking. So he's like, you're not going to Roxbury. And she's like, oh, my God, my daughter told me they were racist here. It's like hilarious. But um, that it's so people don't think to come to black market when they want to find something beautiful, a piece of jewelry for their wife or something like that. But it is a great place to do that. And so now with more mainstream folks coming and seeing that our that, you know, that black market is, you know, is worth spending. I hope that we will see black businesses continue to thrive, not only in in Roxbury, but outside as well. Yes, ma'am, over here. And we'll go ma'am and then sir. Thank you. A, a lot of you mentioned failure as part of the entrepreneurial journey, but I wonder how you tell that, how you communicate that when you're talking with potential investors or uh, collaborators. How, how do you... Um, how do you tell that story? David, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I guess failure, the way to look at it from, so I have angel investment at 40 companies. So the failure from the perspective of an investor is not necessarily a bad thing. Failure is essentially, you've learned something in the market that has not been known before. And so I would turn that around and make it be some discovery that you've made. It's some way of 
de-risking whatever venture you're working on. And so when you express that like, something has failed, you want to move forward beyond that. Now, that's just like market failure, right? So if you thought that you were going to launch this business in a particular part of town and it didn't work out, like you've just learned something about the market, that's something that, that you absolutely will want to embrace. And when you position it with someone externally, you want to focus on that, that aspect of it rather than the, the fact that it just had happened. And so usually when you have that and then a plan going forward, I wouldn't worry about like the, the stigma of failing. And I would say from my perspective, we don't have the privilege to fail and just stay down. Like we have to get back up to David's point and rebound. You, it's a matter of how you rebound and what uh, perspective and you take from that point. Um, and the feedback that you get, this is one of the things that I love about Black Market is that micro businesses have a chance to get feedback from the community without renting a space for $35 uh, per square foot. And I would, I would to talk about failure, I, I would say that who gets to fail is also a really important conversation when we're talking about entrepreneurship and who gets to succeed. Um, and so it's really funny to watch how you said, like how, you know, I don't think any investor would trust an entrepreneur who's never failed, right? Like they'd be like, oh, you're also a liar. Um, and that probably wouldn't work. But, um, you know, it's when we were doing our loan fund um, for minority businesses and we were looking at other loan funds like the Foundation for Business Equity out of Eastern Bank that we're partnering with, with, one of the biggest lessons we learned was that they were trying to have no defaults. And our CEO was like, you can't give loans if you don't want defaults, right? And so what was interesting was on the regular banking side, defaults are a way of life. Defaults happen. Defaults, you know. But then when we start turning to, well, minority business, well, well we can't have any defaults. Well, th that's not right either. And so I think it's really important that we let every community fail and or every person fail because you need to do that to learn and we shouldn't just look past certain people's failures but not not look past others so i think who gets to fail is an a really important part of this conversation one last question sir over there so uh, as i was listening to your story about your mom uh, coming to visit you it it just brought to mind that, and I'm relatively new in this area, but... Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Where are you from? I, I'm, I'm from New York, okay? So I, I've, I've seen this same scenario play through. I, I went to school in Manhattan, and I, I saw um, Harvard, uh, um, uh, Harlem, Harlem, and, and what happened is with Columbia University in that, in that part of town. I, so I, I, I've seen the transition. So as I drive through uh, Dudley's, Station, Dudley Square, uh, as a transportation hub, and as, as I live in the South End, uh, I see the difference between Lower Roxbury mm -hmm. and Roxbury. Mm -hmm. And I see the investment being made with the Alexandra Hotel, which is, is, is good because it's getting closer and closer. But how do you, the question is, how do you get rid of the stigma uh, of, of Roxbury and Dudley and don't, we can't go there? Because there's a lot of opportunity over there. I see all the boarded up stores and there's an opportunity. But part of the problem is to get banking to finance uh, an entrepreneur in that area. So the question really is, how do you get rid of the stigma attached to uh, that area and that community? Kai, I'm going to have you start and then I can talk a little bit from the banking side as well, but. Okay, so I think it starts from the people. I'm a, I'm a person who really believes in residents leading the conversation um, and not from the standpoint of CDCs and nonprofits. I'm not even apologizing for it. That's right. This is a matter of those who are left and those who have the capacity enough to come together and really agitate and put on our activism hats to the degree where we had streets being changed to the South End versus Roxbury inside of Roxbury boundaries. I mean, it's insane that these, um, are, these occurrences are being allowed. And so continuing to understand what civic engagement really looks like um, and then partnering with those uh, other organizations and other agencies in and around the community in order to ensure that 
you know, even some of the educational institutions are just encroaching and, and pushing and putting so much tension inside of uh, the, 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 the neighborhood of Roxbury. So we have to start from, I think, the grassroots perspective and add the capital that Malia is about to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so the first, I think we get rid of the stigma when people who hold stigma against neighborhoods get over themselves. Right, and, and I say that because that's the honest answer. Everything that Kai is talking about is what we have to do because folks are really comfortable with holding a stigma around Roxbury or Mattapan or wherever it is. And you know, the fact of the matter is that if folks aren't going to undo their own internal racism, then stigma will continue. But I think what we can do to transcend the ongoing racism and bias that so many Boston residents have is by not caring. So that's one of the things I really love about what Kai is doing and the work that the Accelerator proved is like, okay, you guys can think that Roxbury is a thing over here, whatever, we're gonna prove you wrong and then you're going to, and then you're going to come. And, and that's really what's happened, you know? And I think if the, the most painful part about what you just said is that kids hold that stigma. You know, like folks know like, oh, I'm from this shitty neighborhood called Roxbury. There's nothing shitty about Roxbury. You know, like, like there's nothing, Roxbury's a beautiful neighborhood. Um, but yet that, that's how it goes. So now from the banking side, there's a couple of things that we're doing. So as I said, you know, we're looking, we're developing products. We just launched this friends and family loan fund, um, which is going to support startup businesses. We're partnering with Black Market because a lot of the folks who Kai is identifying in Black Market are the folks who would be eligible. And this is community underwritten. So we're not underwriting this as the bank. The community is underwriting, but it's sitting in our loans. So they, it's sitting in our loan loss, all of that. They will be part of our bank. But because we know we have bias, <laughs> Right, we know that the community needs to do some underwriting, and so that's one piece um, that we're doing. The other thing that we're doing to get rid of the stigma is everyone, and I have three of my fabulous Berkshire Bank people, raise your hand. Oh, I didn't realize it was three white guys. God, this isn't helping me at all. Um, oh, Alexis, I, baby, I didn't see you in the back. I got four, I got four, Alexis. Yeah. Thank you, see, we're making progress. I'm like, oh gosh, um, but, we, everyone, every person has been to Roxbury. The CEO, the first day that I started working with him, we met in Roxbury and we walked. We walked through Grove Hall. We walked all around Roxbury. We, I took him to um, the mosque. You know, I took him everywhere and we walked it. And that's really, when you talk, again, when you talk about changing stigma, I can create all the products, but if my loan officer is scared to walk into Roxbury, it's not gonna happen. So we are really trying to also undo stigma by having people come together and see like, oh my God, like we walked around Roxbury, it was awesome. I'm going back, back to Final Touch Boutique to buy something. You know, I'm going back to this spot, I'm going back to Sue Your Joint because I love meat on stick. Like, all of those types of things, and you start seeing it's not this dangerous, dangerous place. It's actually a beautiful neighborhood um, that has survived for a, a long time. So th that's how I see, you know, it's like the products, but we gotta get to the problem, right? And the stigma is that we're okay with being racist. Mm. And that has to, that until we're ready to have that conversation, we're kind of just moving pieces around, which is fine which is fine, but it is where we, we are, right? So it's like we also just have to own that as well. So, all right, we are out of time. Thank you so much, you guys. It looks like it's getting a little light out so you guys can walk out and get a little sun and turn to your neighbor and say, thank you for this journey together. I'll see you later.